Uh, welcome everyone to today's webinar on digital communications and clean energy in responding to COVID-19. COVID-19 presents an enormous challenge to, do, to the humanitarian community, not only in terms of the scope of its impacts, there are currently confirmed cases in over 200 countries, compounding many existing situations, but it's also forcing us to adapt and adjust the methods we use to respond. Connectivity and energy have a key role to play in this. The objectives of today's webinar are to give you, um, and to give you uh, some field examples, to raise awareness on some of the global initiatives related to the challenges of connectivity and energy, and to share some guidances and best practices, and to identify some gaps that we need to examine further. Today's webinar is the fifth in a series of webinars focusing on COVID-19 in CCM. The previous webinars have focused on the operationalizing of camp standards in response to COVID-19, community engagement and participation, remote capacity building, adapting urban and informal site activities, and next week's webinar will be on access and armed actors. These webinars are facilitated by the working groups of the CCM cluster. This working group, the Connectivity, Energy and Sustainability working in CCM working group is currently in its formative stage. And that's something we'll discuss a little bit uh, towards the end of this session. Um, before that, I'd like to introduce you to today's uh, facilitators and um, pre sorry, presenters for today's uh, webinar. Um, Facilitating uh, with me is uh, Jorn from NORCAP and Joseph from uh, UNHCR. Um, presenting today, we have uh, Julio Kopi, Digital Specialist at um, Norwegian Refugee Council. Uh, he'll be addressing technical solutions to support digitalized communication with communities. Uh, we also have uh, Amy Jenks from UNITAR alongside Borja Gomez, uh, Energy and Climate Advisor at NRC, and James Arter Hazlip from NRC, who will be providing some uh, field examples on uh, how energy is a cross-cutting enabler. Uh, last but not least, we'll have a third presentation by Joseph Fuani, who's a Senior Energy for Protection Officer with UNHCR based in Geneva. Um, some uh, ground rules for today's session. Uh, we ask that uh, while the presentations are going ahead, if people can mute their microphones. Um, I can hear some tapping on a keyboard at the moment. Um, so just make sure you're muted if you're, if you're not speaking. Uh, we'll have the sessions will be 15 minutes uh, each. Uh, so uh, we hope the webinar in total shouldn't go over 15 or, or 20 minutes. Um, so just to uh, hand things over to Julio. Um, Julio, do you want to go ahead? Uh, I'll stop sharing um, my screen and hand it over to you. Thank you. Uh, and thanks everyone for uh, having me uh, today. I hope that the introduction will uh, give you some food for thoughts. Um, I still hear some typing, so maybe for the sake of the recording and the listeners, uh, maybe it's good to do a round check of uh, mute mics. Uh, yes, excellent, it's gone. So I'll uh, see if I can uh, share the document. This should be no problem. Um, yes, here we go. So you should be able to see the, the document that has been uh, circulated and produced by NRC as an internal document, but it's a, it's a very light policy and guidance. But before talking about that, um, and please feel free to let me know in case uh, we, someone has trouble seeing the, the share screen. Um, I would like to introduce a little bit about um, NRC and uh, what I do uh, very quickly in a couple of words. As mentioned, I'm the digital specialist for programs, which means that I'm not within the information technology department. I'm embedded within field operations. 
Uh, my role is not necessarily to roll out solutions, but to support field operations across NRC uh, in defining their approaches and in, uh, framing the use and um, identifying best practices. And most of all, uh, ensuring that we do no uh, digital harm and do no harm overall. So this is a little picture of what my role implies and uh, what my objective is today is to try and guide you through the set of reflections and learning that has been accumulated so far in the process of transitioning to a different model of running operations in the field uh, based mostly on remote communication and remote management. Um, it, knowing that this is a context that is constantly changing and we have a wild difference in the conditions that our field teams are experiencing when engaging with uh, their own communities and their own interlocutors. Uh, some countries have rolled out very strict policies and, and some of our colleagues are in complete lockdown or shelter in place so they can't move from home. Uh, some other countries are still kind of relaxed. Uh, some others have been on lockdown and now they are talking about opening up a bit again, uh, but we don't know for how long. So we have a full set of uh, conditions that we need to keep into consideration. And what we try to do today is to boil down to a set of principles that can maybe be helpful in, in identifying a, a strategy to cope with the restriction posed by COVID-19. Uh, COVID so, uh, there is a lot of discussions going on about the need for technology to answer to the COVID-19 crisis. And this is to me, I wouldn't say the wrong approach, but this is a misleading approach. There is no technology that can tackle COVID-19 apart from maybe vaccines uh, and, and medicines and drugs and healthcare professionals. There is no technology, especially in the sector of communication with communities that, that is designed to tackle that challenge. To the opposite, we should maybe turn this thought on its head and think, okay, there are applications of existing technologies and things that we do by default that could present an enhanced risk for communities if we just keep going business as usual. I'll go a very quick list of what these uh, technologies are, uh, with a caveat that, of course, it depends on specific context. But, uh, for example, the use of digital kiosks, uh, the use of uh, shared Wi-Fi and Wi-Fi centers, uh, and the use of hotspots, and even the biometrics, sometimes biometrics, uh, notably um, those that imply contact, such as fingerprint biometrics, but even iris scan in a way, because we know that eyes can be a vehicle for transmission, and improper use of biometrics across the board can result in, in uh, spreading the virus further at scale. In case, for example, we do mass distribution or mass engagement uh, with communities. So all these technologies that we do by default, we think as information, access to information as a, as a basic right right now, or even as part of humanitarian assistance, it needs to be done with a digital do no harm principle in mind, meaning, I want to provide information, but the, this should not trump the, the benefit uh, by increasing the risk and the potential harm to communities. What we, so uh, this is what we suggest that the organization consider is how my current setup is possibly contributing to spreading the virus. This should be the first point. Uh, at least this was for us. And engagement with local actors and partners in the field allowed us to reduce harm significantly by convincing even bigger organizations to modify, to have this internal discussion and modify their policies in a way that then became much broader. So now biometrics is uh, uh, discouraged or actually suspended in most country of operations just to give an example. Unfortunately, some other practices are more subtle, such as the presence of Wi-Fi hotspots. Uh, these Wi-Fi hotspots bring, um, facilitate the aggregation of people and go against the idea of social distancing 
and and um, separation of of um, the individuals. So what we are focusing on is what shall we do instead? We should promote and push for technologies that go in the direction of di having a dialogue with individuals or individual household instead of groups of people, uh, or that allow the communication with groups, but uh, without necessarily the physical presence of these people in the same space. So bulk messaging can be an option, um, remote and contactless solutions overall. All this is based on uh, user-centered design. User-centered design means we need to, I know it's ex not exactly revolutionary, but we need to first listen to what the communities are saying in terms of what are their preferred channel of communication um, to avoid, for example, uh, proposing or pushing for solutions that are energy hungry so that they are deplete the resources of the community, they will all use all their data connection. Um, another default reaction is, for example, to suggest to use SMS uh, instead of, for example, uh, WhatsApp messaging. And this, again, default reactions are hardly a good idea. In some countries, SMS are more expensive than data connectivity. So while data connectivity requires more energy, and I'll leave my colleagues in the following presentation to further explain uh, the energy side of, of this webinar. But while energy is definitely needs to be a consideration, um, we should also consider that access to resources uh, can mean the difference between life and death sometimes and, and, and poverty or sustainability of a certain condition. So depleting the resources by pushing information through a channel that is very expensive on the user side is, uh, could be harmful in the long term. User-centered design, remote solutions, and contactless technologies are the way to go for us right now. And, and this has been confirmed by first early trial of the technology. It is also a way to put a little bit of order in our own organizations in terms of, okay, what shall we prioritize in terms of having an impact by phasing out some activities that are not consistent with the new setup? with the remote management, with the remote programming. We identified internally, um, as you probably know, NRC doesn't do health, but it's, health is definitely one of the areas that is going to be prioritized by most organizations. But there are others that can have an immediate impact, a positive impact in terms of continuity of access to services. And, and some of those are water and sanitation, education, protection, and even safety practices. So safety for our own staff and safety for the communities in engaging with our own staff. Um, just to quickly go through the areas of what we consider having direct impact on the continuity of humanitarian action. Protection, because there is a clear risk of isolation of vulnerable people or exclusion of vulnerable people from services. Um, or uh, isolation of vulnerable people in dangerous contexts, such as domestic violence, for example. So these kind of channels need to be boosted, need to be uh, in increased. Education, we don't know how long this will last. And as we have seen in, in many countries, including Europe, uh, there is a strong risk that, that um, the train is passed and that all generations will lose a round of education, these very often can pile on existing vulnerabilities and the lack of infrastructure. Uh, and this can also uh, increase the risk in terms of uh, uh, ex further increasing the vulnerability on some communities. Uh, we identify that some channels of communication and especially uh, WhatsApp uh, and then uh, Viber on Facebook groups sometimes can be used to create virtual classes for little to no cost. And we are discussing with provider how to make this a standard practice. In some other cases, we even use SMS just to provide families with guidance on what to do, how to take care of their kids, how to uh, keep um, promoting some of the curriculum. Uh, and in terms of uh, in terms of other activities, um, I will leave aside because it's otherwise it will be too long, but 
For example, shelter can be used for assessment of medical facilities and see if there is need for quick intervention to adapt some structures to make them COVID-19 compatible. Now, uh, let's run quickly through the main challenges that I will define as two, two main challenges that we have met. Uh, the first is uh, the issue of trust. Most country offices, they try to build digital tools. They don't think that digital tools and remote management as a whole require trust. It requires the community to trust you first. They need to trust because they don't see you. They can't talk to you directly most of the time. So they need to trust that the information that comes from you is true and that they can rely on you in case they need something. So sometimes countries, they just think about bulk messaging, but bulk messaging is the best way to actually generate expectations and breaking trust at scale. If this is not supported by a good communication strategy. So um, this is one first step to how to translate the trust that we enjoy as humanitarian organization that we have been hardly fighting for uh, into something that survives distance. And then how do we trust communities on the other side to do the right thing when we give them information or instructions? We need to trust people and to do that, we need to know them. We need to know the way that a message will come across in a way that will make sense to them and that, will, and that everybody will do the right thing with it. So messaging is never neutral. Uh, messaging needs to be tailored on a specific expectations and capacity and cultural habits of, of communities, uh, be it in Europe or anywhere else. And then there is the misinformation challenge. So we always need to start from the assumption that whenever we send out a message, there are probably other 25 messages coming from other sources. And sometimes they are contradicting themselves. So the first answer is coordination to know exactly who's sending what in the same space, what kind of information is the community receiving. In this way, we can also identify uh, misinformation techniques or practices, uh, or we can eventually convince communities to engage in, in behavior that they maybe will resist against because of misinformation. So these also require uh, a, an active engagement, a proactive engagement and not a passive attitude. And finally, and I will close with this, I would say the main challenge overall is the dynamicity of, is the dynamic nature of this, con of this context. We can never design something thinking that will be valid two days from now or two weeks from now. The fact that many countries are opening and closing movements and restriction and fine tuning as we go, it's a clear sign that if we build something that is not flexible, probably conditions will change, priorities in country of operations will change, and our teams will probably either ignore it or jump to something else or not follow the protocols and generate risk. So I will close it here because I think I'm really running uh, out of time, but I, I just shared uh, this document that I'm, unfortunately I didn't really follow uh, in uh, detail. So it's um, attached to the presentation and here you can find a little bit of what we consider to be a primer in terms of engaging uh, with communities and with your own teams in building a system, including some examples of technical solutions that are out there. Thank you, Brian. Do you want to go ahead? Yeah. Thank you, Thank very you much. so much for that presentation. Uh, thanks a lot, Jiro. Um, we will uh, also be able to follow up uh, in uh, the later questions and uh, and also with regards to the more social sides of uh, community engagement and uh, communication with communities. We uh, have already dedicated uh, another seminar to it and we will uh, uh, see this from uh, other angles so uh, today we're really grateful to have a deep dive into the different uh, technical solutions available and uh, the impact and challenges with regards to those uh, should we uh, then uh, move over to uh, the energy part 
Uh, and uh, Borja, will the will you start uh, off, or is it Amy that will uh, start your uh, presentation? I think I can start. Do you see me? We see yes. you. Do you hear me? Do you see me? <laughs> Very good. Okay. Uh, maybe who who could share the screen of our presentation as uh, can I do that or yeah it's uh, on the added uh, options mm -hmm. one second I thought that we compiled the presentation and we sent it to Brian um, let me, I, can, let me I can also try to share screen, Borja. Just okay, like you don't mind? Yeah, one second. <laughs> Sorry, it's trying. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, anyway, I will start. Um, so I am Borja Gomez. I am an energy advisor and uh, lead, uh, leading the uh, energy program here and at NORCAP. Uh, as you know, NORCAP is part of NRC, and around 8% around of the budget of NRC. And uh, we are now deploying around 1,000 experts around the world. Uh, Maybe the next slide will apply. Thank you. So just a very brief introduction of the Clean Energy Program. Uh, so we are focusing on three different uh, aspects of the, of the energy challenges. And it's one is uh, improving the access to clean energy. And, and this is the, the topic for, for the rest of my presentation. And uh, so we are, we are working on Tanzania, DRC, Chad, Uganda, and Ethiopia. We are also improving the coordination in the sector. We are heavily uh, supporting the GPA in Geneva. Uh, and then the other, the other uh, part of the, our work is uh, green humanitarian operations. We are currently in a three-year funding cycle, um, uh, around 35 million NOx, I think we are. Uh, but we are think we are potentially uh, aiming at uh, multiplying it by five for the next five years, actually. So we have uh, 20, 28 energy experts in, in um, actually 15 now currently deployed and many other countries that are coming in online. Next, please. So uh, I don't want to, to talk more about uh, this topic because, uh, I mean, I, I think that we have uh, better person to talk about uh, the, the, the challenge of energy in humanitarian settings and specifically for COVID response. But I would, uh, I would actually, sh I would want to share these uh, findings that I had when I went to, to the field uh, in, in February, right before the, the emergency. And, uh, and I would like to highlight uh, the amount of energy that is consumed in a, in a camp for cooking, and uh, the picture on the on the left is actually in um, in the host community around the near Usu camp in, in, in Tanzania, and uh, and this is a an example of the amount of, of energy that is needed for for cooking, and and this time spent in collecting and, and buying that is is very very noticeable when you're visiting the, the camps, and so the point that I wanted to make is that. Uh, I saw how important it is for the people to be free to move around and to, to collect the, the firewood and to buy to collect the firewood. So I, was, uh, I wanted to highlight the importance of finding a new way of, of uh, a new paradigm, I call it there, a new way to, to, um, you know, to, to provide the energy needs of uh, people in, during the COVID uh, response. We are 
if we want to, I mean, if we want to, to um, if we are pro proposing to, to, uh, to somehow to, to reduce the mobility of the people, then we will face uh, scarcity of fuel for, for cooking. And I think this is a topic that uh, uh, James and, and later and, and Amy will talk about, but I think I wanted to highlight uh, from my experience with my own eyes uh, how important was was that so that is probably related to to the 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 the, the food that is provided to the, to those people what what is the energy that, that this the particular food that is delivered by world food program for example uh, what is the amount of energy that this food is requiring so that's another topic that we can also talk uh, and please, uh, I think that this uh, webinar is, um, uh, it could be a good opportunity to also talk about this, these topics. Um, uh, yeah, that's it. I, I think that uh, I would leave the, the, the virtual mic to James Haslip, who is actually one of the uh, NORCAP experts, and he has do, done an, an amazing job at, uh, at uh, assessing the energy needs and uh, has a, a longer longer experience dealing with uh, uh, offering uh, offering uh, clean energy to the to to vulnerable people so thank you james please i can you hear me yes okay great thanks Borja. um yeah so i thought maybe it would be uh useful to start uh with with the sort of global architecture uh of what we're trying to do with the clean energy challenge so to sort of top down and then sort of break it into focus focus down after that so <clears throat> for those of you who are new to the energy issue in, in displacement um the most notable development in recent months has been the launch of the clean energy challenge which was um kicked off at the global refugee forum um in December, and that was one of six sort of main thematic areas that were, that were discussed at the highest level. So for us, that was a really big win politically to get that on the top table. Um, and that, that is the statement there. All refugee settlements have, and uh, nearby host communities have access to affordable, reliable and sustainable modern energy by 2030. So um, that basically uh, parrots the language of SDG 7, which, which is broken down into, into sort of specific targets. Um, and in reality, this is a sort of externalization of our own uh, global strategy for sustainable energy. Now, I think the, the important thing here really is, is that we're acknowledging that we cannot uh, deliver on this SDG alone. Uh, so we're, we're, the challenge is actually to, to work with all of our partners um, um, and host governments to really make uh, progress. Uh, and the strategy has four different outcome areas. So it's, you know, cooking, uh, household electricity, uh, power for, for infrastructure, and, and etc. So um, I don't know if Amy, if you're controlling the slides. Yeah, okay, next slide. Um, so the challenge really sort of lends itself to the architecture of the Global Plan of Action, the GPA, where Amy is working at the Secretariat. Now this sort of predates the challenge by uh, 18 months, um, but UNHCR was part of setting this up, and it's the closest thing that we have to a sort of cluster, if you like, on energy in humanitarian settings. Um, and this was set up explicitly to address the challenge of, you know, who owns energy and displacement. It's sort of fallen between the chairs historically. It's been one of the sort of uh, failures, if you like, in humanitarian response. It's been a, an externality that's not been addressed. So, so the GPA is, an, is, a, is the global architecture for bringing all of the key stakeholders uh, together. You can see the top line in the steering group is the lead agencies, including UNHCR, IOM, World Food Programme, et cetera. And then below there is a sort of key implementing partners, research partners and, uh, uh, and technical experts. Uh, there's a small secretariat, which Amy is a part of in Geneva, uh, hosted by UNITA. Um, and then five working groups. So the idea is to sort of define specific jobs um, and then coordinate these uh, amongst all the key uh, steering group members. So currently UNHCR is co-chairing the working group on data and evidence. Um, and then other, the other partners will sort of lead or co-lead some of the other working groups. So this, is the, this has been a big, I, I would say, progress in recent years and, and, and gives us a lot of um, access to resources, both technical and financial, to, to push forward SDG 7. So um, next slide. 
Okay, so drilling down just for the benefit of those that are sort of uh, vaguely familiar with energy, like what is energy all about? Why is it important in, in displacement? So here I've just put down some basic facts and figures about the cooking sites or the benefits of clean cooking. And this, these numbers come from a study conducted, uh, funnily enough, in the Nyaragusu, which Borchholm uh, also mentioned there. Um, three big categories of benefits, health and protection risk reduction environmental benefits, and then livelihoods or economic development. So those three pillars of, of impact, I would say. So in, in terms of health and protection risk reduction, uh, energy uh, fuel collection for cooking is a major source of SGB, uh, SGBV risk. Uh, and also physical exhaustion from the collection of biomass, often many kilometers traveled, um, if not on a daily basis, then, then many times a week. Um, household air pollution is, uh, I mean, generally in, in low income countries, it's a, it's a major killer. I think uh, 4 million premature deaths per year are attributed to household air pollution from uh, biomass combustion for cooking. Uh, and so that equates to about 20 odd thousand refugees per year who, who are dying because of that uh, traditional fuel. Uh, in in Nyaragusu, um, our research found that uh, a third of all deaths were actually linked to upper and lower respiratory tract infections. So just to sort of uh, drill down on, on, the, on the health impacts there. Um, in terms of environmental benefits, there's huge, huge uh, benefits here for switching. For example, in this scenario where we, where we switch 100% from, from wood fuel and charcoal to liquid petroleum gas, the sort of bottled gas. Um, if that were to happen, and there's a project proposal to, to, do, so, to do exactly that, uh, we would save um, over 2,000 hectares of forest per year and offset the net carbon emission reductions of over 110,000. So it's, it's also an environmental agenda. And then finally, and I think this is perhaps the most significant one for, for refugee welfare uh, in, in the long term, um, is, is the livelihoods. I mean, what, the time spent collecting fuel is, is staggering. Um, in in Nyaragusa, it was 19 hours per week on a, uh, per household. Uh, so this, you can calculate, as we did, the shadow value of that time. You put a dollar value on it as part of a bigger uh, cost-benefit analysis. But that, that free time, um, uh, it can be used for income generation um, and, and also, um, uh, yeah, for, for uh, education, etc. Uh, and, and cooking on traditional fuels also takes up a lot of time, six hours on average spent per day, um, whereas LPG gas is incredibly fast and efficient. And that was actually, in our research, the first thing that, that um, the, the uh, households uh, said when we asked them, what, what do you like about it? They said, it's quick. You know, they didn't talk about the emissions or the, the, the clean air. They just said it's fast. You know, we can cook our breakfast in, in five minutes and the kids get to school, et cetera. So, uh, and then the top line there is the financial cost. Actually, because of the scarcity, uh, households are already spending um, on average three times more than an average Tanzanian household for wood fuel or charcoal. Um, so that's also incredibly high financial cost as well. Uh, next slide. I think there might be a couple of photos actually. Yeah, so this is a photo from that research conducted in 2017. That was the sort of core research team. Um, which was largely uh, refugees themselves. Now, the, the, I think the key point here is that to design um, projects that, that increase energy access, we need detailed and site-specific research and analysis. And UNHCR, at least, does not currently collect or have access to that kind of information. Um, so our offer from DRS, our division within HQ, is that countries who want to take up the energy challenge, because it's really a way of you know, decentral, it's a decentralized agenda. You know, it's not something that we're going to push from HQ. The countries um, themselves have to say, okay, we want to pursue this agenda. We understand the benefits of doing so. Please help us and provide us with uh, the, the technical uh, expertise that, that, you, that you offer. So, um, next slide. Um, so, you know, we, we, we really struggle with data um, on, on, on the energy issue. You know, we have some, some very small um, amounts of information, but the detailed stuff is, is, is lacking and it requires um, often qualitative, time-consuming research. You can see there some, some of the surveys being done in that study was 500 households uh, and a picture of the marketplace where fuel is, is bought and sold uh, in, in Yaragusu. Um, next slide. And now, now switching briefly to the electricity side. So energy is, has the two core components of 
fuel for cooking and then electricity for, for, for other services. So I think this is pretty obvious really just to sort of say what are the benefits of both the household level and the infrastructure operations level. So electricity obviously you know, allows for charging and use of key appliances, mobile phones, radios, etc., extending the hours of work and study. Um, reducing the household air pollution where, where uh, kerosene is, is sometimes used as a as traditional lighting fuel, uh, and also some other sort of harder to quantify um, uh, benefits, things like uh, you know, being able to entertain and gather in groups at nighttime, some of the things that make life worth living. The energy is very, very key to that at the household level. And then at the operations level, and th this is actually sort of cut more or less from the briefing that we've issued through the GPA uh, that I think uh, Amy will, will mention um, about what are, what are the sort of benefits of uh, reliable um, and clean energy access for operations. So obviously with health, it's about powering refrigerants, sterilizing equipment, ventilators, lab equipment where that exists uh, for, for health response, um, pumping and distributing water for hygiene, uh, which is of, of particular concern now more than ever. Uh, and then some of the communications things, um, I was interested to hear Julia talk about uh, Wi-Fi actually presenting uh, bigger risks. So um, as, as a sort of way of clustering people physically together in, in the COVID uh, situation. So, but otherwise, you know, communications are key to getting the message out and, and you know, telling people how, how to, uh, how, how to um, respond, uh, for example. So yeah, next slide. I think some of that's pretty, pretty obvious. Um, here is a screenshot of the visualized baseline data that we put out to accompany the Clean Energy Challenge. Now, uh, this is online, you can access it, and it looks, it looks perhaps better than it really is, because it, in reality it's a kind of cobbled together uh, spreadsheet from, from various uh, indicators, basically what we could gather from HQ, but it's by no means comprehensive and, and is only partially covering uh, the aspects of the energy strategy and, and SDG 7. So um, we're committed to um, improving and expanding upon that, both in terms of the technical coverage, but also the geographical coverage. Right now it's 111 settlements, mostly across to Africa. Um, and that's a job that we're pursuing through the GPA working group on data and evidence. Um, next slide. Uh, and I think, yes, this awful slide full of numbers, I don't, I'm not gonna read through that, don't worry. For the set, it's being recorded. So if you are interested, I mean, this just highlights some of the key sort of uh, baseline data of the Clean Energy Challenge. Perhaps just to point out one of them, uh, which was perhaps most relevant for the COVID uh, response. The bottom line um, in that baseline, we've got 300, 3,000 odd boreholes uh, that are registered in, in the database. 83% of which are manually operated, um, which I find, which is obviously a very high number and, and very surprising. I don't know what that, we don't know what that translates to in terms of volume of water, which is perhaps a more important thing to know. Um, but clearly there's a need to, um, or a lot of uh, uh, scope to, to, to power electrically pump water in a lot of refugee settings. So that's, that's one sort of thing that we can extract from that, that baseline. Uh, next slide. Um, okay, here, I think this is of, of interest to perhaps, perhaps others. I mean, um, uh, Eva, of course, from IOM is somebody who's, who's a steering board member of the, of the GPA, and I think she, she, like myself, is very happy to have uh, access to GPA technical outputs, many of which are supported by NORCAP and the, the Norwegian uh, investment in the, in the GPA. So in specific terms, this includes helping us define TORs for the country experts, including those that are deployed by NORCAP, and that's a really big uh, help for, for us at, at, in UNHCR where we have limited technical uh, capacity to, to do that. Um, um, another output is the standardized assessment um, for, for intended for use by the energy experts. Um, so a sort of step-by-step -step guide to creating this pipeline of clean energy projects. Um, that is another important output coming out uh, later this year. Um, and then Something that sounds very dry, but I think is a significance to the sort of greening of operations. Uh, some fantastic work led by Mark Gibson at the GPA Secretariat on standard clauses for power purchase agreements. This sounds incredibly technical, but this is important to uh, shifting away from this terrible situation where we're spending 
insane, amount, insane amounts of money burning diesel under blue skies um, to, to power infrastructure where we could be making quick savings um, to invest in longer term contracting with solar power, um, which, is, which is often more reliable, certainly cheaper and cleaner. So that's a sort of technical fix offered by some of the, 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 the working group on, on that through the GPA. And then a th uh, fourth output there is something that's being led by WFP, but is of relevance and use to UNHR, IOM, and anyone else on um, a sort of online training tool and energy for food security, uh, which is obviously closely linked to clean cooking. So I think those are just examples of some of the things that the GPA is offering our operations. Um, next slide. I don't know how, I hope I don't have too many more actually, I can't remember. Okay, yeah, this is a couple of slides actually about uh, external partners. Um, because we, as I say, we don't have the capacity to sort of deliver the, or conduct the, the, the uh, research um, that underpins the projects that we need to uh, develop. So two, both of these projects are funded by DFID, UK Development, um, focused on humanitarian energy. Um, and they have budgets that are, that are uh, demarcated for the humanitarian sector. And MEX is uh, focused on, on uh, clean cooking fuel, and they pledged a million pounds worth of uh, research R&D capacity to the humanitarian sector at the GRF, so that was a big win for us. Um, and also an extension of the Moving Energy Initiative, which is a big project that ended uh, last year, and that's being um, sort of uh, let's say revamped or, or kind of extended under a different name. And that'll, that'll have a much bigger budget of around 12 million pounds over five years. And so um, UNHR and others can draw upon that uh, to conduct um, much needed research and technical assistance to inform the kind of projects we need to push SDG 7. Um, yeah, and then I think the next slide has a couple of partners who are project-based, who can also conduct uh, this kind of research-based advisory, um, um, but, but funding for those, for those organizations and the work that they do has to come from, from uh, whether it's donors or, or private sector partners keen to invest in this space. Um, and I think the next slide is the last one um, I'm gonna mention on the Clean Energy Challenge Action Group. Okay, so this is the action group, and I just want to make clear that although this is sort of uh, something kicked off by UNHR. It's by no means um, unique to UNHR, and it's something that is that is, as I say, sort of uh, akin to the GPA. So it's it's of course as much belongs as much to IOM and WF, uh, WFP as as the other implementing partners of the GPA. Um, but it's it's meeting sort of well in theory physically once uh, every other month, I think, in Geneva, a sort of multi-stakeholder forum. Um, uh, of, of both technical and implementing partners, but also investors, both public and private. And the idea is to sort of over time create a marketplace where implementing partners such as, um, sorry, lead agencies such as UNHR, IOM, etc., and implementing partners present their uh, resource needs, but also down the line energy projects for investment by donors or private sector. Uh, that, that's the idea of the action group. And there's a sort of secretariat for that managed by the GPA. They're co-chairing it with UNHCR. Um, but it's something that we would love WFP and IOM to join. Uh, Eva reminded me that the language of the Clean Energy Challenge refers to refugees and not displaced people uh, more broadly. And I, I can't do anything about that myself. Um, but, uh, but as far as I'm concerned, this is a common agenda shared by all members of the GPA. So I, I think uh, as from, from a UNHCR perspective, I would like to you know, remind everyone that, that, that we're, we're, this is a interagency uh, concern. So we want to see coordination across across all members of the GPA. Thank you. Well, thanks, James. Um, talking about connectivity, my Wi-Fi is not great, so I think I'll keep my video off. <laughs> but I have a few words. Uh, I think James, you just covered the topic uh, quite well, but. I'll just discuss a bit of the relevance of energy sort of in the context of the COVID response uh, and really kind of share some of the work we're doing through the GPA and also have some questions for you guys on how we can uh, sort of support as this pseudo cluster mechanism uh, and your responses. 
so my name is Amy Jenks. I'm working at the GPA Secretariat. Uh, I think James sort of covered the, what the GPA is. Um, but yeah, we've basically been coordinating different agencies to support the increase in sustainable energy access and use uh, in humanitarian response in the last two years, so starting in 2018, um, and have been uh, kind of in contact with yeah. investors and trying to support uh, someone's mind. Well, I, think, uh, I think uh, your microphone is uh, on. Hi, Mika. I think your microphone is on. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'll continue. Um, so yeah, through the GPA, we've been uh, supporting the clusters with resources, expertise, uh, advocacy to sort of integrate energy into their programming. Um, sort of as the support unit, we always get this question, where does energy fit in the system? And I guess the, the answer really is everywhere. Um, you know, people in their homes need energy for cooking, for um, powering, you know, their devices. Um, people need, uh, you know, at the community level, you need um, access to sustainable energy for essential services, uh, as James was talking about, water pumping, community centers, um, schools, hospitals, etc. Um, and then more at the institutional level, um, you know, energy is vital to powering offices and, um, and admin compounds, etc. So we see it's this cross-cutting issue. Um, which sort of means the responsibility lies everywhere and nowhere. Um, so we've been sort of trying to support the clusters into integrating this. Um, and it's been interesting dialogue but, uh, between us and the CCCM cluster so far. So uh, here to support. <laughs> and I guess just a note, um, because you can't really generalize, um, you know, we, we say we're advocating for sustainable energy. Um, but I think we need to recognize that the, the delivery, how that is delivered sort of differs depending on context. So, of course, in a really acute emergency, sort of the procure and provide way is, is how you go to get things to people quickly. Um, but then as things become more protracted, I think we're, we're really advocating for, um, you know, the, the use of market-based solutions where possible, um, and also for agencies to buy electricity as a service, um, sort of as we do in our normal lives. Um, so, just to note that the context is important. We understand it's not possible everywhere, but I think the main point is to try to enable sustainability um, from, you know, earlier on, uh, as early on as we can, really. And a few words on sort of what we're seeing now and what we're hearing from our network um, in terms of the COVID-19 humanitarian response. Um, of course, movement has been limited. Uh, the sort of normal way of working has been disrupted everywhere. Um, we've heard from some of our colleagues that, you know, the funding and uh, has been shifted to priority areas, health, wash, etc. Um, and so sort of our question that we're asking is how do we integrate energy needs into the current response, into the current realities, uh, and try to ensure that um, we are enabling this sort of sustainable approaches where possible. Um, and some of the, or the major links um, between energy and, and in relation to the current COVID response, um, I think as, as James was talking about and Borja, I mean, fuel for cooking is quite vital. I mean, if people get um, food, but then they can't leave their homes to get uh, the fuel that they usually need, um, then you really need to make sure that, you know, we're, we're working to make sure that people have uh, access to cooking fuel. Um, I think UNHCR has released some guidance that maybe Joseph can talk about later, um, but really just working within the local context to, to make sure people do have those basic resources. Um, in terms of communication, um, like everyone has said, I think it's we need to get information to people. So, um, you know, the, the behavior change uh, according to the current COVID context is uh, is achieved and the virus is not spread. Um, and people need sort of uh, electricity to charge their phones, radios, uh, etc. And then on the health side, um, electricity supply for sort of isolation clinics uh, will be important. As you see on the side, there's um, this on the left-hand bottom corner on that picture. I mean, that's just a sort of solar container solution. So there are, um, you know, existing solutions to deploy quite quickly uh, to power health centers. 
Um, and then on the livelihood side, um, if, there, if it's possible to enable electricity for businesses and, um, and sort of people in their homes, um, you know, there's small solar home systems that can do that, that are sort of um, shown in those photos. And then just a brief note on sort of what we've been doing through the GPA. Um, so in the last few weeks, we developed a briefing note that's really aimed at decision making, uh, decision makers and donors. Um, just to say that, look, you know, we, we know that things are shifting in the current response, but also here are, are the benefits of energy. Um, and these are some considerations for action. So you can uh, access it through that link. I think we'll share this after the webinar. Um, and then as a next step to that, uh, we are trying to draft some technical guidance um, for practical support uh, for field colleagues. So uh, it's really an invitation for you to input into this, um, into that link in version two. Um, so we, we do want to hear from you. What does it, the response look like uh, in your context and sort of what solutions or support or guidance do you need? Um, so we do have in the network a lot of different energy specialists um, and companies and we have sort of this network of practitioners who have been working um, to enable sustainable energy. So it's, you know, whatever sort of connections that we can make to get the resources to the needs uh, we would like to help. So, yeah, we can send that around after and it would really be great, I guess, also in the discussion after this to, to hear from you uh, what you need. And then there's just a list of some resources. Um, I think, yeah, those can just be sent around after, but there are, I think down here in the bottom, if there is the need to procure sort of standalone solar kits, um, there's guidance here um, that you can refer to. And that's all for me and I'll hand it over to Joseph. Okay, uh, thanks, 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 Amy. Uh, today, I, uh, my role will just be to, to wrap up uh, what we, we presented uh, around energy. Next slide. I mean, yeah, I think uh, my colleague uh, James has already alluded to, uh, to the Clean Energy Challenge, which is um, maybe the, the main reason why we are sitting together talking about energy because it's 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 something which we need to address as a as a team uh, it's because it's a cross-cutting issue uh, so talking about clean energy challenge it means that we need to really uh, start to worry much about clean energy what what we mean by by clean energy i know there is a lot of talk around uh, clean coal technologies clean gas technologies but uh, i'm going to do much on uh, renewable energy which is the which is the real clean energy uh, at our exposure and for us to to maximize uh, in this space if ever we are really going to meet the you know the the expectations of the clean energy challenge so when we're talking about clean energy uh, about basically renewable energy we're talking about a replaceable within natural life cycles stocks of power that will never run out so these are uh, originate from directly from the sun or indirectly so so they can all be traced back to to, to the sun, which makes them environmentally friendly because they don't uh, tend to uh, jeopardize or to increase the uh, the balance of our uh, of the toxic greenhouse gases. Next slide. So the main one, uh, which is sort of uh, tend to be the default one, is uh, is solar energy because you you uh, you notice that in our space, every time uh, when we talk of uh, clean energy solar energy has become the the default one but as you will notice uh, as my, most of you might know it's it's not the only option in, in fact in some other instances it's uh some other renewable energy options are actually uh, more viable and uh, more reliable uh, than than solar so we need to to really you know embrace them and uh, uh, consider them as as an option going forward so the main side of it uh, of solar energy is the solar thermal, solar thermal applications, which uh, can be used in form of uh, water and space heating. Uh, it can also be used in drying, uh, especially in the agricultural sector. They are using solar dryers to do that. Well, the cooking side also, we've been talking a lot about solar cookers, but the recent um, uh, innovative uh, inventions are also, you know, uh, giving us very good uh, even uh, solar e-cookers which 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 basically converts the 
uh, solar energy into into into, into sort of um, for, uh, for battery storage and then from battery to to cooking. We can also under thermal we can also use it for baking distillation that is our water purification for cooling and also we've got even solar power plants which are actually grid connected or even uh, applicable for for mini grids so that's that that's the thermal side of it then we can also maximize it in uh, via solar pv applications uh the familiar solar home systems uh we also have got um, solar powered mini grids or even solar powered uh, grids which are sort of are connected to the main national grids we also have got in, even in telecommunication which we've been talking about here uh, there are some several uh, base stations for communication which are powered by solar and very much common in in africa uh, water pumping is also one um, common use for for solar uh, uh, solar um, use also in uh, in health clinics where we've got pv systems used to provide electricity in our uh, in health institutions and also education so the list is uh, is can go on and on and on where we are actually using solar pv to provide electricity for several applications then uh, the next uh, technology is um, uh, next slide please is is uh, hydro i think yeah so this 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 is one uh, technology which is not really common in in this space but uh, uh i would give an example here uh, with the, within UNHCR, we've actually uh, done uh, uh, some studies in in pakistan which has actually uh, shown that there are some sites of uh, of interest to us uh where we've got our places of concern and host communities which can actually benefit from uh, from hydropower compared to other options available so going forward we we are looking forward to pursue such projects where we maximize hydropower to provide electricity for our persons of concern so two main uh, ways is to use runoff rivers where we convert the the head and uh, the flow of that water to produce elect uh, electricity which can be fed into a into a grid or this can be the main grid or even a, a mini grid in some applications commonly in africa you can also just convert it to mechanical energy where it is used just to run some some mills for for different uh, applications Next slide. And uh, the main one, which is sort of common, is to use the dams where we produce, you know, uh, mega power from um, from such big infrastructure to feed into national grids. So this is for, you know, for bigger investments where, where, where we need to have really bigger output. Next slide. Then uh, we also have got um, uh, bioenergy and wind so bioenergy is basically from uh, plants and uh, and animals and this can be used in liquid form solid form in gaseous form to to, to meet uh, different applications i think biogas is one of the popular ones for solid biomass we've got uh, briquettes which have already been mentioned in some of the presentations on the liquid side we also have got biodiesel which can be used in place of uh, of, of, of diesel so solutions are plenty on the wind side uh, depending on wind speed if it's uh less than four or five meters per second water pumping is one main application which has been used for years and is really available so uh instead of thinking of solar water pumping as the only solution we can also you know think of of wind because it's also another another option milling machines have also been powered with uh where we've got low wind speeds for high wind speeds we can actually also produce electricity i'm sure we have you might have seen uh, wind farms which are also connected to 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 the national grids or even for for independent mini grids or a combination of of these to have what we call hybrids where you might have maybe solar and wind or solar and bioenergy you know depending on what studies have shown to be the most economically you know uh, viable option in terms of uh, supplying the the energy needs next slide next slide so uh, yeah i'm not going to talk much about this i think um emmy and uh and james have done justice to, to this topic clean energy uh, in relation to, to COVID. -19. maybe i'll just uh, emphasize the fact that achieving a sdg7 will uh sort of give us a high level of preparedness for for such a crisis like uh, like COVID 19 so it means the more we we 
get closer to achieving this goal, the more we reduce the, the risk of uh, spreading COVID-19. That, that, that has really been, been explained. And uh, the renewable energy options I have just spoken about, uh, you know, I'm sure you might, you might have picked up that they are in many cases very much reliable. And when it comes to sustainable, they are the main options which are 100% sustainable with respect to even all the other SDGs which we are trying to also make sure that we are complying to their expectations too. <clears throat> Next slide. Uh, so now I'll, I'll, I'll jump into just to give you a picture what what, what we did within uh, UNHCR just to gauge the level of preparedness for, for COVID-19 from our energy environment uh, uh, focal points. Next slide. So uh, the, 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 the first question was around to, to just check um, if, if there is really some level of uh, preparedness in terms of uh, provision uh, to meet energy and environmental needs. And you can see from, from, from the chat there that, yeah, of course, you, 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 you will hear the yes, but digging down deeply, you would realize that uh, it will not be, uh, you know, like full level of preparedness there will always be some 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 gaps and and at the same time we have got some instances where no is also the the full answer which means that uh the, there is actually a lot which we need to look into going forward to ensure that we are really prepared um next slide and then the other question was uh uh on uh just gauging if there is an appreciation of the impact or the effects which would come uh, with, uh, with with COVID. There were several answers, but the but the key ones were to do with the access to 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 energy for I mean cooking fuel, which 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 is which is one main thing uh, of concern. Even now we are also getting you know, uh, those um, indications that it's it's really a challenge, which which really needs to be to be addressed. You know, taking into account the fact that. Most um, uh, operations really rely on um, on firewood or on sourcing uh, the cooking fuel from other service providers. And then the second one is to do with obviously uh, transport uh, sector has been uh, affected by this, so it means uh, movement of uh, goods and service uh, and, and, and products has also been you know affected, which has to some extent also caused. Uh, limited access to spares and uh, other uh, things which are required by the by our persons of concern. So uh, next slide. So it, it sort of I mean gives us a picture of uh, you know what we really need to you know to be to to be addressing going forward so that when such a, a crisis uh, comes we should be more prepared than than now so on the environment side obviously with the cooking comes deforestation with limited movement comes the challenge of uh, waste management because you really need to be moving your stuff from one point to to another uh, and also on the washing side since water has become one of uh, the key requirements in, in 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 responding to 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 covid it means that the demand is sort of increased uh, at the expense of uh, maybe the capacity of uh, the local infrastructure available. Uh, then uh, there is also the challenge of uh, general environmental protection because uh, uh, most of these uh, expertise re rely on um, you know information they get through network networking like what we are doing right now. But because of uh, of, uh, of, of, of what is happening now, most of them, you know, are now working from home uh, and, you know, without really much access to our persons of concern and limited, you know, access to, to Wi-Fi, which has been already alluded to. So it means, you know, the, the level of networking to really get the answers when you need them is been also compromised. Uh, we also have several projects to do with uh, uh, reforestation, which has also been um, affected by, by this because it means that access to those sites is now limited, which means uh, which poses a risk to the survival of uh, those plantations. Now, now that we, 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 we have really, you know, uh, uh, sort of uh, 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 get to a point where we know that, uh, you know, we need to promote clean energy and uh, use uh, this uh, limited energy sparingly. It uh, 
brings us to the final point i want to talk about uh, uh, energy management so you know we now need to start to embrace it because we have got limited energy resources and uh, we are we are also keen to make sure that we you know we meet the sdgs and if we are to do that we need to be talking about this so when i talk about energy management we are talking about uh, some kind of uh, programs of uh, well planned actions or activities aimed at controlling and reducing and and entities energy bills in a manner that minimizes the detrimental environmental impacts while meeting our uh, production and uh, service targets so it's 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 all about still meeting our energy needs but this time uh, by reducing our energy use intensities so the service will still be maintained the quality of the product will still be maintained but at the key point is at a lower uh, energy use intensity so the two ways to do that uh, is through energy conservation and uh, energy efficiency next slide so on energy conservation, we are uh, talking about uh, reducing or going without a service to save energy. So for example, when we embrace the practice of turning off lights, when we can and maximize natural light, it's an act of uh, energy conservation. So and it, it really you know goes a long way to reduce our energy uses, our energy use intensities. If we you know start to utilize the use of residual heat when, when when cooking it means we are uh, reducing our call for a for a service that is for for electricity but still getting the end result which we are looking for so it's all about uh, avoiding uh, avoiding waste for energy use and unnecessary energy related services and uh, and practices uh, next slide then 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 on energy efficiency we are talking about now uh, promoting the use of uh, efficient uh, technologies efficient uh, equipment uh, optimizing our, our 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 processes so it still boils down up to the fact that you get the service you are looking for but this time you are using an efficient technology which means your energy use intensity is low and it in in the in, in the long run it reduces your energy costs it reduces your carbon footprint it uh, reduces the, the the energy demand especially now that you know we know we, we, we are agreeing that this uh, energy is uh, actually in in, uh, in short supply so it's 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 the attitude way you know you 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 embrace that if if you can do without it if you cannot do without it then you have it as much economical as uh, as possible so in conclusion next slide i would just want to emphasize the what my colleagues have already alluded to the fact that now with this COVID-19 I think uh, the main takeaway is for us to you know to promote homegrown solutions and if we look at renewable energy resource it's readily available right uh, in our homes and if we are to be safe and to be better prepared we need to promote such uh, solutions which are readily available and uh, secondly uh, James has uh, spoken about the the project marketplace for for the clean energy challenge, where we are calling for projects uh, which can aid response to to COVID nineteen within our space, which can be you know implemented within uh, the next seven eight months. And uh, we'll be happy if there is uh, if you have got such projects, you share with us through uh, the, the 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 clean energy. A challenge um, a action group uh, that is through 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 GPA because it, it will really go a long way in in in, in our response to to, to this um, pandemic. So in yeah, in short, in a nutshell, that's 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 all from me. Over. Um, was the, yeah, sorry, it was the ending a bit abrupt for me to really get it. Um, first of all, thanks a lot to all of the speakers and uh, Julia, Borja, James, uh, Amy, and uh, Joseph have uh, very much contributed to what we were hoping 
would lift uh, the topics of uh, the working group uh, in relation to the COVID the responses. Uh, should we start off uh, with the questions uh, to the presenters? Maybe, uh, Brian, you would have uh, the best overview of that. Sure. Um... We have some questions from the registration form, but I'm conscious that most of them are around connectivity and uh, Julio has had to leave us a little bit early. Yeah, um, and, uh, yeah sorry. And uh, being cautious of time also, maybe we should uh, go directly to uh, quick information on uh, the work group and uh, the way ahead. Uh, so, mainly um, the reason we come together in uh, webinars these days is because we're uh, separated and uh, from the anthropological side of things, uh, separation is also, uh, normally followed by a liminal phase where we are disoriented. So, I'm hoping that uh, some of the disorientation uh, around these topics and how they relate to the COVID responses uh, has been shed some light on now and that we uh, will also be able to use this experience uh, to better include the connectivity and uh, clean energy responses to ensure sustainability in uh, the settlements we work in. This is uh, the background and the rationale between and behind the work group on connectivity, clean energy and sustainability in displacement settings. Uh, and uh, as we've heard now, uh, connectivity is uh, core to uh, enable uh, proper communication and uh, access to information for people. It's also becoming uh, very important for people to access both their their rights, uh, but also their services in uh, displacement. Uh, they need uh, access to healthcare systems, uh, and they need the information on safety and uh, access to food and other services. And uh, as an enabler of uh, all our work, uh, the energy uh, is uh, cross-sectoral and also then cross-sustainable development goals enabler. It uh, allows us to deliver better education, better health and sanitation, better uh, distribution programming and uh, it is uh, vital to our operations on the more uh, organizational side of things. Uh, we would like to take this group forward uh, to ensure that uh, in this uh, <laughs> current liminal phase we learn as much as possible but then uh, also that uh, we will uh, come out uh, with improved uh, programming, both with uh, relation to community engagement and uh, communication with communities, and that would benefit from the digital solutions that are available. We would like to ensure that uh, access to energy is a part of uh, all the programming we do and that it uh, enhances the programmatic responses and that of course this uh, energy is clean. Um, I think that uh, a way forward would also be to promote the substantial work that's done in the sustainable settlement uh, publication that uh, gives a very good uh, overview of well-tested solutions on 
materials on energy on uh, water and uh, and also on uh, resources uh, as an overall uh, that may guide uh, our progress in uh, this work group so we strongly would like people to report in their um, their own programmatic uh, activities but also then uh, to ask uh, for uh, other experiences and resources uh, that may benefit their um, programming and just to to give an overview even though travel is limited these days water needs uh, energy all the procurement processes all the ict all the facilities management uh, all waste uh, disposal uh, different events and uh, bringing groups together uh, human resources demands a lot of uh, energy and uh, we we see this in connection to the degradation of the biodiversity and air pollution and greenhouse uh, gas emissions in um, in our operations so it is evident that we need to move this field of work forwards and uh, we need to bridge the way we reach people the way we ensure that they access the right information and the way we bring uh, energy into clean energy into our uh, in camp management programming we will see higher numbers of climate displacement we will uh, meet new challenges after this and we need to make sure that we we are in line with the, the demands of the future so um, thank you all for your contribution and over to you brian thanks Jorn. Um, just to kind of uh, before we wrap up um, the uh, connectivity energy and sustainability in ccm working group is um, we're working on the the tor for it hopefully we will finalize it in the in the coming weeks and uh, it'll be really good to get the camp managers from the field their perspectives on it so if there's anyone uh, willing to to look over it and give their feedback uh, we'd be very happy to share uh, the draft uh, just so we can make it as uh, the objectives as as relevant to you guys as possible um should i perhaps uh, wrap it up from here i i know we're we're an hour and 20 minutes into it um, just a reminder that on the event page uh, for this webinar, you'll uh, see all of the, the guidance mentioned during the, the slides. Uh, there's also a, a feedback form and um, a box where you can enter your email. So you would be on the, the working group's mailing list. So you'd be able to keep up to date on the, the working group as it moves forward. Um, I'd like to take the opportunity to uh, thank all our uh, presenters and um, the people participating and and asking the questions um, it's been uh, it's been very interesting uh, just also finally to mention that next Tuesday's webinar is on access and armed actors um, the central question that they hope to answer is how can camp management ensure a balanced and principled approach in responding to the needs of affected people while working in remote management. Uh, challenges in, ex in accessing and engaging with local authorities and armed actors during COVID-19 response. Um, so that's, that's it from my side, Jorn. If, do, you wanna, do you have any closing words? Um, yeah, the, this working group was uh, driven forward by climate change and is now extremely relevant in uh, the COVID response. And uh, I hope it, it is engaging because I know it's of a great concern to many of you out in the field. So please contribute and please uh, help uh, challenging us to move forward on this important topic. Thanks to all.